So, so far we've, we've been talking about transport and subsurface. We talked about static behavior in terms of capillary pressure versus saturation curves and capillary behavior in terms of height rises in um, capillary tubes, etc. That was enough to get us some semblance of the architecture, but it said nothing about uh, rates at which we could move uh, fluids. And so now, uh, what we were talking about last time was Darcy's Law. And applying Darcy's law to not just single phase behavior, but to look at um, cases where there are two fluids. The two fluids could be water and denapple below the water table, or they could be water and air in the Vado zone, or they could be water, air, and napple, or denapple or, or L napple in the Vado zone as well. So there can be more than two fluids. And we won't talk about the case where there are three, but. Uh, you can imagine that it gets more complicated, and, um, but is, is certainly doable. And so what we talked about last time was the ability to be able to uh, define flow rates for flowing materials. And so it's just like these figures show, you get invasion by some fluid. Um, typically the volume of, that is shown here of the cube uh, or the prism is the representative elemental volume. We're looking at saturations of the red versus uh, any other fluid that's present in the system. I guess the air in these particular cases is shown as um, clear. And you can see kind of the grains in the background. Um, but these would be the volumes that we would use to average saturations and use in our calculations for both um, what the saturation was as a function of capillary pressure, our PC versus saturation curves. And also now, what we know about is our um, relative permeability curves. So that's kind of where we, we left it last time. So that's, my, that's our discussion last time. I can recap as we've done in the past, but maybe I won't spend too much time doing that. Um, we're talking about multiphase flow. Um, and specifically in permeability. So what, what we'll talk about is maybe some, some of the realities of permeability in porous media. We'll talk about how we can look at this multi-phase flow or single-phase flow in fractures and multi-phase flow. Um, <coughs> these curves, as we kind of alluded to last time, the permeability saturation curve, this is our, our KR curve, versus the capillary pressure saturation curves are related to each other. They both have saturation of water, of the wetting fluid, as their basal ordinate. So we can stack them one above each other, and we've done that in the past. And so we'll, we'll go back to talk about that. But just maybe as recap, you'll, let's just revisit this figure that we have, and we can probably do all the recap we need to do on this. The recap, I suppose, is that if we want to calculate the, the flux of fluid through the system, Q, we can get it from um, Darcy's law. We can essentially get it as a function of pressure, but we have some quirks on that, right? Because we vertical pressure gradients are gradients, but they don't give flow. And if we want to get that, that, this is Darcy's law written for single phase fluid. But if we want it for more than one phase, then we just multiply it by what we've called the relative permeability. Uh, again, a bad figure, but relative permeability of fluid one and viscosity one. The permeability is the permeability of the rock. It doesn't change. Uh, we're 100% filled with treacle, 100% filled with gasoline, 100% filled with air, 100% filled with water. The permeability would be physically the same value, same number, numerical value. And so that allows us to apply a flux. The flux is in meters per second. If we want to multiply both sides through by a cross section, a full cross sectional area of the core. then we can do that on both sides. 
and this will be what we have called Q1. So this is uh, meters cubed per second, volume rate. Um, it's based on the total area of the end of this core. And clearly, this total end of the core will kind of be divided between the two parts that we talked about. Part of the area will be A1. Huh? I don't have a green. Is that a, oh, I do have a green. Part of the area will be A2. And really what we're doing is we're, we're kind of modifying this in that the relative permeability kind of mimics these areas of the thing that's filled. This is just for kind of il illustration in your mind. Obviously it's not like this. It's all mixed up in the individual pores. And so it's relatively homogeneous across this face. But at micro scale it's in these proportions. And so that allows us to get the flow rates for each of these phase phases. And it would be the same for the other part. A relative permeability for phase two, same permeability, viscosity of the fluid in phase two, and the same pressure gradient, and total area. These two areas are the same, as indeed are these. And that, that's all we're attempting to do. And since it's kind of, we've no, made no mention in here of these, rel these separate areas, A1 and A2, because we've kind of accommodated them, as we said last time, in this relative permeability term. And the relative permeability terms don't look like what those areas you'd expect to look like, like this. And they don't look like uh, an X curve that is restricted to the, the no-go zones inside, outside the irreducible saturations. It, it don't look like any of those. They look like these physical curves that are on here. These are real curves. And we said last time that um, these real curves, uh, well, these real curves um, don't sum to one. If you add the curve for the wetting phase, this must be water, right? Because at 100% saturation of water, it gives a relative permeability of one, or would do, and the converse for the other one. Uh, they, they just, uh, they don't end up being equal to one, and that is because the, the non-aqueous fluid will preferentially fill the big pores first, where it gets entry into, as we've talked about. And that's why this relative permeability is higher at irreducible saturation than this one. <coughs> Not particularly important for this class, but just an observation. And we can use this to be able to, if we know what the saturation of the system is, then this one here, if this is, uh, if green is napple and red is water, then this is SW, saturation of water. Then by definition, this has to be the red one. So this, this would be what we've called k relative 1, which is equal to k relative of the wetting fluid, which is about, I don't know, choose a number. This is 50-50. This is 65%. Oh, sorry, no. That's the saturation. Saturation is 65%. This number here on this scale is point two five, probably. And conversely, the relative permeability curve for the lower one is the relative permeability for fluid two, which is in our case. relative permeability of the non-wetting, which is equal to, I don't know, less than 0 0.1. And so immediately from this, if you know what the 
viscosities of the fluids are that are flowing, if you know the upstream and downstream pressure differential and the length of the core, um, then you can calculate, and if you know the permeability, permeability of the core, these two permeabilities, K without a subscript, are the same through the core, then you can calculate the flow volume rates of flow volume, volumetric flow rates as a function of these two relative permeabilities. That's it. So that's kind of uh, where we, we finished off last time. And you'll get a chance to do that on uh, maybe assignment four, I'm not sure. We can look at it in class if you, if you wish. Not today, perhaps, but closer to the time. So the other thing is that when we talked about relatively, relative saturation capillary pressure curves, uh, we also saw that they had hysteresis. They had a, a drainage curve where we would drain fluid out of the porous medium and then when we re-wetted it by supplying water again it would come down on a different trajectory. You could expect that the relative permeability curves would be exactly the same with some kind of hysteresis. So here is the would be as you're draining water out of the system I guess you're moving from 100% saturation to some different saturation. As you're doing that you'd come down this kind of no-go region and then come down here and if you get to some point and then you re-wet it you go up a different trajectory and that just means that physically uh, if you don't know the direction in which you're wetting and drying you have two choices for a relative permeability to use and you have to choose between them so you'd have to know what, where in the site. You'd have to have this curve that defined it that well, and you'd have to know the soil well enough to know what it's doing, uh, to see where it is in terms of previous histories of drying and wetting. The reality is you never know that. And so when we talked about using an X curve, uh, it might be actually pretty much as good as anything, that you used curves that actually look like this, uh, you can probably get away with doing that. And so these are real relative uh, permeability curves, but the reality is you may not know uh, anything to the order that you see here to be able to solve it. And even if you could solve it to that level of detail, you may not need it because of so many other unknown factors. It's not like building an airplane where you manufacture what you're dealing with. You're working the subsurface and you have very little idea of what's going on there and of course one of the big challenges and one of the big areas in what we're talking about is how do you do that characterization which we'll get to later so and they might change based on the gradation but let's not waste any time on that so so what we'll do is we'll come back and look at how relative permeability behavior fits in with capillary pressure behavior but first let's talk about the one thing we talked about up in the this and talk about permeability of uh, fractures and what we can do is we can use relatively simple capillary models you remember when we talked about capillary pressure behavior we talked about a single capillary that we could get height rise in it and we can use that for an analog for imbibition within a pore we talked about two parallel plates with fluid rising between them and we could use that as an analog for imbibition of fluid into uh, a fracture. We can do the same exactly when we look at uh, pore scale models for flow. So we dealt with this in 303. If you take a two parallel plates, like a duct for instance, that are set next to each other, that have some gap between them, and you flow a fluid between them, the boundary conditions for the fluid would be that it would have zero velocity at the wall because it's attached to the wall. Um, it would flow uh, from a pressure gradient upstream to downstream. It would assume a velocity profile which is parabolic, which is like this one. It would have a maximum velocity in the middle of the, um, the flow channel. And the volumetric flow rate is absolutely controlled by um, 
the characteristics of the fluid and the aperture of the fracture. And so we can write an equation to get the, I don't know why, the, um, yeah, very strange, the average velocity. So this is the actual velocity. I suppose if we drew an, an average velocity, it would look like, I'll do it on here. An average velocity would just be a similar area. So this lovely fuchsia area here is the same area as the parabolic distribution of blue. And so that, that's the definition of an average velocity, over bar here. Acceleration due to gravity, aperture of the fracture, the upstream head, the length over which it flows. This is dx. This is dh, related to pressure, right, in terms of that. And kinematic viscosity of the fluid, uh, which is what? Uh, nu is equal to the dynamic viscosity divided by... So that's not uh, dynamic viscosity divided by density of the fluid, by definition. Because these are on opposite sides of Reynolds' number. Let's use, oh, it's down here. Okay. okay. Glad that I can actually remember what it is. So, all right. So what we could do then is, I'm not going to worry too much about the math, but uh, talk about just what we do. So if we know what the flow is within one fracture, and we can characterize it in terms of velocity, we could multiply that uh, velocity here, which is this, by its aperture, and I suppose we should probably multiply it by its width because okay. otherwise it's not an area I think we have to do that and so if we know the volumetric flow on one fracture and we have a rock that has a whole bunch of fractures in it we could just because these are all flowing in parallel if we have two fractures we have twice the flow of uh, one if we have five fractures we have five times the flow so what we could do is we could calculate how many fractures we have in a meter. If we know the spacing between fractures, if it's a, a tenth of a meter between fractures, then the number of fractures we have in a meter tall is going to be 10, which is this. And so we just multiply the flow rate from one fracture by the number of fractures, which is 1 over s, and we get an equivalent um, volume of flow. And that allows us to be able to define a conductivity of a fracture. And actually, I think you've already used it. We can define the hydraulic conductivity of a permeability of a fracture as equal to, or a fractured medium, B cubed over 12S. B is the aperture of the fracture. S is the spacing between individual fractures. And this is for a single system of fractures. If we had, you could make an argument, I think, I can't remember in your assignment, whether you did it for a face with a single set of fractures in it or with multiple. So you could imagine a porous medium that looked a bit like this, or sorry, fractured medium, that had a bunch of fractures in this direction. And the separation between these was spacing S and you have a bunch of fractures orthogonal to those, that wouldn't be unusual. Look at the rocks on 322 as you go down uh, on your way in and out of town. And so if, if you have flow rates due to flow in fractures in one orientation, and you have flow rates in fractures of the second orientation, you just have double the flow rates. And so you could also calculate, this would be for uh, single set of fractures, in other words this, and this would be for a double set, in other words this, right, this fuchsia face is just this face would be here with two sets, it would be permeability of two <coughs> versus permeability of one would be just uh, B cubed, you know the answer to this already yourselves, 
if they were the same aperture it would just be equal to this it would just be equal to so that's where the, this number comes from here and so kind of it's a, a standard result that you that you can use and so the reality is um, you're never going to be able to get into a rock and find out that it's 0 0.015 of a millimeter in aperture but what you could do I suppose is you could rearrange this and you could rearrange it so that it would be I guess it would be k1 is equal to oh, sorry, times 12 s multiplied times cube root So you could rearrange this equation in terms of b. <coughs> and so if you did that, you could measure the permeability. We'll talk about it later in the class by pumping tests or whatever. It's not very difficult to measure the spacing. You can see that in wells and in boreholes and in core. You can see it in road cuts. So you get a pretty good estimate of that. And so you can estimate the magnitude of the aperture. And that seems like a futile idea. But if you know the magnitude of the aperture, then maybe you can say something about things like capillary entry pressures and you can also say that if you stretch or compress the rock how much that aperture might change by if you measure the displacements and so in cases where you might be interested to know how the aperture changes as you change the pressure in the rock or as if you put a nuclear waste uh, repository in it that heats up the rock and causes the fractures to close down you should be able to make a good guess at what the changes would be. And so it's not completely a futile effort to be able to define permeabilities in terms of um, capillary behavior. Incidentally, uh, I'm, I think we'll use it later, and I'm not sure I've introduced it. You can also make models that represent porous medium. And so in the same way that we took this cross section here uh, and represented it as being full of fractures, you could imagine taking a, an idealized idea of a, a cube of rock, and that cube of rock has a bunch of capillary tubes in it. And that's kind of the approach we used for um, the estimating what capillary behavior might be. But you can also calculate the permeability for this. And it turns out that each, if each of these capillary tubes is of diameter lowercase d, then the permeability of this rock is something like um, d squared times the porosity, n is porosity, divided by 32. Or d squared n over 96. Seems kind of arbitrary. This one represents the case where you have the capillaries going in just one direction. 96 represents the case where you have the capillaries going in all three directions. Right? You can imagine a, a cube of rock that looked like this. Getting my money's worth of drawing today. And this cube of rock had some capillaries that were going across it in this direction, but it also had some capillaries that were going across it in this direction, and so it had some capillaries that were going across it in this direction. So orthogonal uh, tubes, connect, connected or not, it doesn't matter. And so 32 is just a, um, a third of 96. So it means that you have a, a material, you use the porosity to calculate um, the, vol the void volume versus the total volume of the rock. And then if it's 30% is the void volume, you just divide that 30% of the rock area into how many tubes can fit into that of, any, of a given diameter. So that defines this number here. No, it's not, it's not, not important to understand that, but it seems kind of arbitrary that you have 32 or 96, uh, but it just depends on the kind of model you use to represent it. And so we have equations then that allow us to get permeabilities as a function of geometric parameters of the rock. And I guess you'll note 
I just take a couple of these, you'll note two things. One is that whether we have a, a parallel plate fracture or capri tubes, because we can get closed form solutions that tell us what the transmission of fluids along those geometries is, then we can calculate these permeabilities. Also, because we can get little closed form solutions of what the height rise in the capillary is for both parallel plates and for the capillary, we can also get information on the capillary behavior for those idealized systems. And so that gives us the possibility, maybe, that we can use these systems to relate capillary pressure and relative permeabilities together. And, and we'll do that in a second. So the other thing that might come out of it, if you're looking at a fracture, then you'd expect the relative permeability curves to be exactly the same as, um, or similar to a porous medium. There's no reason it wouldn't be. You have the same kind of processes going on. I suppose you could think of a, a fracture. Fractures aren't really parallel plates that are separated from each other. They have contact surfaces. So if you look at a fracture, you'll have one wall that looks like this, have another wall that looks like this, and so you could imagine that each one, and it would be flowing into the page. If I can do that like this. And so you could imagine maybe that each one of these little voids was like a little tube. And so there's lots of kind of complicated models that represent the behavior a little bit differently. And so these tubes would have different... Uh, diameters and then they'd have different uh, behaviors in terms of representing relative permeability if you had multiple fluids. So we can use exactly the same approaches to this. Okay. So, right. What do I want to talk about now? Okay. I will go back. So let me do this then. Um, people must have got that. You can go back to the video. Let me look at something else. It's not a recap, but it's uh, probably a, it's a recap for a later class, but let's use it today. It's pretty straightforward. It has all the information on it that we've just talked about and tries to synthesize this idea. So we drew the other day, on Tuesday, a very squashed capillary pressure versus saturation curve on top of a relative permeability curve, this diagram here, right? This, this curve was probably... Um, a third of the height of this curve just because we're squashing it into a particular space. But you know the characteristics of these curves. Let me make it a bit smaller so you can see the axes. The relative permeability curves have these, uh, both curves have these no-go regions. This is the minimum saturation of water that we can get in the system as we drain it. This is the minimum saturation of the non-wetting fluid that we get in the system as we try and pump more water into it, it's still left. We have what we call PC0, which is our bubbling pressure uh, that describes the system. And we have this hysteretic behavior that when we push a napple into it and push water out, we go up one uh, trajectory, one particular trajectory. And when we uh, re-imbibe fluid, which goes spontaneously into it, it comes down on a different trajectory and finds this point here. So these kind of represent no-go regions, but we do have this kind of incongruous part here. If we look at the relative permeability curves, they also are kind of excluded from going in these regions of irreducible saturation. And the reason they don't make much sense there is because in these regions, the, for instance, this region on the left, the water would be in such a small proportion that it wouldn't be connected between the upstream and the downstream. So it's a little island that's stuck in the middle of your core. All the stuff flows around it. The non-wetting fluid flows around it, but the water can't go anywhere. That's why it doesn't really define what the relative permeability. The relative permeability here is approaching one, and this relative permeability is zero for water because the water is not going anywhere. So that's what these uh, curves represent and look like. They stack directly on top of each other because they have this exactly the same uh, horizontal axis, saturation of water. 
between 0 and 100%. Um, we define the vertical ordinate by the capillary pressure, which at bubbling pressure we call PC0. This is the, the pressure you have to get infinitesimal saturation of oil in the system when you're just pushing it in. Uh, and it goes in at some very small proportion. Keep on rise, raising the, the pressure, and it will go up. This is always an equilibrium saturation. You remember we talked about how to calculate these by increasing pressure and going across to an equilibrium saturation, jumping up the pressure and going across to another equilibrium saturation. These dots def define the curve. So that's one of your assignments. So I'll just get that off to avoid confusion. And so we've suggested that these curves are, can be drawn from little capillary diagrams. And so let's look a little bit at that. First of all, I guess it's important to realize that these sit on top of each other and what the relative features of these represent. The other interesting feature is that we use this term called the J function, the Leverett function. And we always said that the bubbling pressure was equal to when this J function is equal to 0.3, roughly. So that seems kind of strange and interesting, but let's see exactly if we can figure out where that comes from. I don't know that we need to do the derivations here, but you've seen all of these um, equations before. So I have a capillary, a height rise in a capillary from sitting it in water, a height rise in a parallel plate capillary. It rises to some height, uh, hc. If we represent a porous medium by this capillary, the height rise is four times the interfacial tension, the diameter, and the unit weight. We said that that kind of represents, since the height rise um, multiplied by the unit weight of fluid gets rid of this gamma here. And so, yeah, good idea. Take a picture of it. <laughs> Excellent. The height, the pressure that uh, is represented as the difference between the air pressure above the meniscus and the pressure right on this um, catenary, which is the meniscus, is equal to this, PC, this capillary pressure. We can do exactly the same in a fracture. And so that's what we have did maybe in our first couple of times together. We derived uh, each of these equations. Today, what we said is we can also use these geometries to look at what the permeabilities would be of these media. And so for parallel plate permeabilities, we said it should equal b cubed over 12s or b cubed over 6s. It doesn't matter. Let's use 12. And for a porous medium made up of capillaries going in both directions, or three directions rather, it would be the diameter of the capillaries times the porosity and divided by 96 or 32. So that gives us our real permeability. We know that if we have more than one fluid traveling, then we need to use a relative permeability. It's always between 0 and 1, see, on this graph here. And it will change as a function of saturation. And so we can think of that kind of since we're using this equation, which is Q is equal to the relative permeability of the fluid, fluid I, which is a function of saturation, multiplied by permeability times pressure change times distance over viscosity. So this is Darcy's law written for two fluids. So we can define maybe a, an effective permeability. This is kind of an, an effective. Viscosity is not part of it. Because we can write it that way, because we know that for one phase flow, the Darcy's law is written as this. So all I'm doing is taking the terms that are equivalent to this, which are the ones in, it's magenta, isn't it? It's not cyan magenta uh, here. And so that's all that's lined here. 
that's exactly what this is. And so if we can get the Darcy's law, which gives us a velocity, this is in units of meters per second. If we multiply it by area, we end up with this. Uh, I don't know what 0.6 is there for. That's for previous life. I think that's not relevant in this case. And that's just Darcy's law written in terms of volumetric flow. So the other interesting thing we could do is since we realize that permeability and capillary pressure are both written in terms of the geom geometric features of that porous medium, either the aperture or the diameter of the um, capillaries. So this is for static fluid flow. It's a function of diameter of the capillary. This is for permeability. It's a function of diameter of the capillary. Then maybe it's possible for us to be able to link permeability to the capillary pressure curve. And that's kind of useful because capillary pressure is impossible to measure. It's a really difficult experiment. But getting a permeability in the field in situ is, is really easy. So since permeability and capillary pressure both contain these same terms, maybe it's possible for us to link these values together so that instead of measuring these capillary pressure versus saturation curves, we could measure permeability and get this straight away. So that's what we're going to do. And the math isn't important. Actually, the math isn't very difficult. But if we just take the, the equations for the porous medium, these two here that are outlined, and write them here, capillary pressure um, is equal to force sigma of the diameter. Permeability is equal to the diameter, porosity, and 96. So we could each rearrange each of these in terms of the diameter. And if we do that, we get each of these two equations here. This is just rearranging this in terms of diameter. And we get this. This in terms of diameter has to be square root. I've changed 96 for 100 just because I'm a coward, and it's easier to calculate things with uh, 100 at, at a square root. And since these have to be equivalent to each other, we equate them to each other. So if we equate this to this, we get something like this. This is 4 sigma over PC in black, which is this red part here. This is this term here. Square root 100 taken outside is 10. And then I'm just doing some manipulation by multiplying both sides by through by PC for sigma on both sides. And if you do that, you start being able to cancel some things. What can you cancel? Um, uh, what am I re re rearranging? I'm rearranging in terms of, OK. This and this go out. This and this go out. And we're left with square root k over n, pc over 4 sigma. So this would be 10 over 4. And Therefore, 10 divided by 4 would be, oh, I can just take them both off on the other side, right? So I can take them on the other side, it would be 4 over 10. And so the equation you get is that this 0 0.4 is equal to 4 over 10, which is permeability, porosity, capillary pressure over this. And you've seen this before, right? This is the Leverett function, the J function. This is what we've called J before. And this term 0 0.4, well, I think it was 0 0.3, it's pretty close to it, right? This bubbling pressure 
is this. So if you thought it was kind of bizarre that we had some single number, and where did that number come from? That's exactly where it comes from. So the big picture, you don't need, the math doesn't matter at all. The big picture is merely that um, cap pressure in some way is related to um, permeability, porosity, interfacial tension, So let me back off. Capri pr Capri pr the product of capri pressure squ with square the, the product this side here is any capri pressure. So this is capri pressure through throughout this range here. But a very specific one is when this magnitude is equal to 0 0.3, then that is actually the bubbling pressure, which is the entry pressure. And the reason for that is that we chose this particular equation here that represent the height rise in this single tube. So this is the entry pressure, PC0, which is measured here. So the equation that we have on this axis is capital pressure, which is all of these pressures up here, defined as a difference between the non-wetting and the wetting pressure, divided by interfacial tension, and multiplied by permeability over porosity, square root. not cube root, square root. And the value of this curve happens to be 0 0.3 at this point, or 0 0.4, doesn't matter. And so that's where these curves come from. And so the math isn't important, but the realization that there's a linkage between permeability and entry <coughs> pressures is, because it's much easier to measure permeability and porosity and interfacial tension, all of which are absolutely known, and if you know those three values, then you immediately have PC and how PC varies with saturation because you know absolutely the shape of the curves in your nodes. So, 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 yeah, so that's worth, worthwhile. So that, that's all the message is here. And so they're intrinsically linked uh, to each other. Not only do they sit above each other on the same common sa scale of saturation, but you can link magnitudes of permeability, and this isn't permeability, it's relative permeability, directly with capri pressure. Okay? So hopefully that makes some sense. What else do we have to look at? So, all right. So that's now, so that, that's exactly what this is. So this is, the other uh, outcome is that ob observed is that capri pressures, entry pressures, are proportional to 1 over permeability square root. That's just the same as the Levert function. So we don't really need to talk about that. Just an interesting correlation. But the point is that if you know permeability of your material, the porosity of your material, the interfacial tension of the fluids, then immediately you can construct these capri pressure curves because you know exactly what they look like. I don't know. I'm going to give you whiplash, I think, if I go back so far. You've seen them in the past, right? Where? It's this curve. Yeah. You see the lever function on the side. You see this value of uh, infusion, 0 0.3, roughly, right? Not very clear, but this term here is just capri pressure over interfacial tension, permeability over porosity, square root, I guess they've written it to the half, and that's it. So you need the bubbling pressure, which is often the, the single parameter you need. So this is PC0, which you also call the bubbling pressure. And you also know the, the shape of this. And, you know, it's not going to be the same for every material, but it's a good enough approximation to use. So, so, so that linkage is quite important for us to be, to be able to make, because it allows us to do lots of things which we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Okay. What else are we going to talk about today? 
So I did a full calculation last time, so I won't do it. So the other thing that I'll that we haven't said is that so far we've defined Darcy's law. I didn't draw it here. And we know that I'm not gonna belabor this point, just you know, you don't need to you can do whatever you like, but I'm going to move through this quickly. So, but I'll make, just make the point that Darcy's law we can write, and we know we can write as equal to minus relative permeability of fluid one at whatever saturation of fluid one is times permeability times viscosity times pressure change with location. Darcy's law. This is pretty good for us for, for many of the applications we'll use, but for more sophisticated things and for modeling, then we have to deal with geometries of flow which are more than just a single core sample with a homogeneous gradient in it. And to do that, then we need to use a conservation equation. And the conservation equation relies on um, mass accumulation mass accumulated plus mass in minus mass out equals zero. So I'm mimicking this equation underneath here. You've seen these continuity equations before, conservation of mass, that's why we talk about it. This little equation here is conservation of mass. This says that mass in minus mass out must equal the mass accumulated because they sum to zero. That's all this equation does. And this mass in minus mass out is written in terms of substituting in Darcy's law. I suppose we could calculate what the units of this would be. Um, the apples to apples has to be, right? So this would be, both sides must be the same. This might be the easiest one. So it would be kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, density of the fluid, saturation of the fluid, then dimensionless, porosity, dimensionless, and time. So one over seconds. So the units would be in mass per unit volume per time. Kind of strange units, but that's what it is. This has to be the same. Um, it must be meters, no, so it's not. This is a velocity, so it's meters per second per kilogram <coughs> per meters cubed meter. So indeed they are the same. Doesn't mean the equation's right, but it means it could be right. I've heard me say that many times. So I don't yeah, so that's so all we need to know is that there's a, a conservation of mass equation. And that says that in your little differential cube or your, your Reynolds transport theorem volume, the mass that comes in minus the mass that goes out is the mass that accumulates. If we can write that in terms of properties that are important to us, then we can write a differential equation. And then it turns out that since we have two fluids, this is porosity. This is the saturation of fluid one and the density of fluid one density of fluid one and the flow of fluid one. But we can also write it for fluid two as well, right? Because remember in our little, um, whoops, in our core, we're able to divide it between two fluids. U one, U two, row one, row two, etc. right? And so, yeah, I really don't want to belabor. I just want to make the point that, so you end up with two differential equations because you have two fluids. And you can think of them as being two conservation equations which really don't interact very much with each other. as separate tubes. Each half of the tube or proportional part of the tube that flows parallel to each other is separate. This would be for, say, water. This would be for the, the non-wetting fluid. 
and you, they have all the parameters in that we know. Pressure, relative permeability, viscosity, saturation. And so if you look at the unknowns in this, we don't know necessarily the pressure in fluid one. We don't know the saturation. But the other things are all constants. The geometry we'd know, time we'd know, the frosty we'd know, permeability we'd know, relative permeability we'd know if we knew the saturation, so let's assume we know that. We know the viscosity, the densities, we certainly know what gravitational acceleration is. So the unknowns we have in this equation are the saturation of the water and the pressure of the water, pressure gradient from upstream and downstream. The things we don't know, I guess I always write them as question marks, don't I, usually? So the other things we know, but these we don't. These are what we want to determine. Pressure and saturation. In the second fluid, we have a saturation of the second fluid we want to know. And we don't know the pressure for this. So we have four unknowns and two equations, so we, we're kind of screwed. So what we need to do is find some other constraints. And the other constraints are pretty straightforward. We know that the pore space has to be completely filled with one fluid or the other. And so the saturations of those two fluids must add to one. So that's another constraint. Three, three equations. And we know the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. We know that the capillary pressure must conform to a curve like this. Not an easy curve to deal with, but you, it basically says that capillary pressure, the difference between the, the pressures in the two fluids, is some function of saturation. So, and so now we have four unknowns, two saturations and two pressures. I mean, four equations, so at least we can potentially solve it. And that's what's done. It's solved. We won't talk about the solution of PDEs in this class, but that's simply what's done. And it comes from conservation of mass, defining some variables, defining a rule that accounts for the frictional losses. You can think of this as it's a mass balance equation. It's not an energy balance equation. And so certainly there's friction, there's losses, energy losses in the system. And Darcy's law is basically what says what those energy losses are. It's friction. So in the same way that on a pipe, you define the shear on the side of the pipe relative to the flowing fluid. And we do something like uh, the head loss is equal to a friction factor, length over diameter, V squared over 2G. Then this little pipe with the friction factor, actually the Darcy's law that we've derived that looked at the, the closed form solutions for this equation is exactly, uh, is exactly the, the flow equation for flow in a pipe. And so Darcy's law represents the energy loss by friction, viscous friction. Yeah. And so what we could do is we could use this equation now to be able to solve some problems. And so one set of solutions that we can get as we come up to the hour mark is uh, by the same lever in the J function and someone else called Buckley. I, I don't know much about their, their I have no history. Uh, to recount. And so you can solve the, the equations that we just put here, these four equations, and you can solve it for a petroleum reservoir. And if you do that, the solution that you get looks something like this. And so this is uh, an oil reservoir. You could think of it also as our tube, which is just uh, arranged along here. And it's a petroleum reservoir, so it starts off filled with um, oil. And you want to displace the oil by pushing the oil from this boundary all the way along here to collect it at the other end of the tube. That's basically it. Happens to be at an angle, just making life complicated. It'd be much easier if it was flat. And so what do we know about this system as we start to push water into the system? And of course, if we want to displace the oil, we can't just suck the oil out and leave nothing 
in place, we have to displace it by another fluid. And so if you think about what that system might look like um, along the length of it, then this length here, we can think of as this graph here. And this other ordinate on this would be the saturation. This would be saturation of water. So this is zero saturation. This is 100% saturation. I guess this is a decimal here, 1.0. And so what would the initial saturation look like along this reservoir? Well, it's oil, but if it's at its native state, then it can't be more saturated than the irreducible saturation of water. So the amount of water that must exist in here must be So the initial state must be that all the way along this tube, it would be 10% water and 90% oil. I'm just making up the numbers, but you see. And so that has to be the distribution along it. So that would be this blue curve here. So now, from this end of the system, we're going to start pushing in water. And so that's kind of here, because this is the x-axis. So what's going to happen? Well, water is going to invade. This tongue of water is going to try and displace the oil. The oil is going to go down. And so this red, this first blue curve that I drew would be what it, actually that doesn't exist on there. This would be at time zero. And then you'd get this tongue of water going in at time, it says T zero, but let's call it time one. And so this means that now, uh, in this part here, this is now 70% water. I apologize it being super crowded. And 30% non wet And so and so forth. And so as it pushes along, you get to the ultimate state if you're able to get there. Maybe the ultimate state is that it looks like this. So this would be T infinity. Let me draw T infinity as green. So you can actually see it. So T infinity would look like this. And now this would be the non wetting fluid which is equal to the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid, which looks like it's 20% or something. And then by definition, this would be equal to eighty percent. And so not I don't want to overcomplicate things. All it is is that we can use those equations. We're not going to. And we can actually quantify the rates at which we can push fluids out and replace them with other fluids. And we can do it based on the parameters that we know we have and in accordance with our ideas of the physics of the porous media. And that is that Darcy's law will control the rate at which this invasion occurs. Uh, com combined with the pressures that are applied. And the physical constraint on the system is that we can't get, um, we, c we will start with no less than the irreducible saturation of water in the system. 
We can't have more petroleum or DNAP in the system than that, than one minus that amount. And the best we can ha hope for at the end is it will end up with mainly water, but also the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid in it. And so for petroleum reservoir, that means that you're going to leave some amount in place. It's going to be at least 20%. In reality, it's probably nearer 50% or 60% uh, that you leave in place. And for the remediation of denapple sites or napple sites, it means you're also going to leave some in place. And it, if you're lucky enough that it is only 20%, then that 20%, because it dissolves so slowly and is uh, toxic at such low uh, concentrations means that it will dissolve into the water forever and flow out of your system and if you can only get 20% out then pump and treat can't be a viable way to remediate, not to get it out it, you'll never get all of it out it'll take you hundreds of years to remove it by dissolution and so, so those are the physics of fluid flow that we perhaps need to understand for this and I think there's some other stuff on here that I'm not going to talk about so I'm going to leave it at that. We'll talk next time about how, how these things move from a, a practical standpoint. So no more equations, lots of, lots of cross-section figures to next time. But we'll talk about that. So that's it.